Mysterious Stone Ruins, Chapter 4. Who built the stone sacred house? One day in 1871, German geologist Karl March was exploring a high plateau between the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers in southeastern Africa. He found himself staring at a wall of giant stones. Standing up to 32 feet, 9.7 meters high, the wall extended 800 feet, 244 meters to enclose several smaller walls and two cone-shaped towers. More stone structures stood on a nearby hill, and stone ruins were strewn across the valley below. The complex had been discovered before, but it the encircling outer wall of Great Zimbabwe's great enclosure rises to a rate of 32 feet, 9.7 meters, from a base that is 17 feet, 5.2 meters thick in places. East African traders, 8800 to 8500 BC, 0, 80, 500, 1000, 1500. Remained a mystery. When Portuguese traders visited the area in 1552, it was already abandoned. Villagers told them about the site they called Zimbabwe. The main meant stone dwelling or house of stone in the local Shona language. But whose house? What kind of community developed here? At the time that March visited the ruins, most foreigners still knew little about African cultures. He assumed that Africans would not have been able to build such magnificent structures. March thought it was built by people from the Middle East. He guessed that it was Alpha, the legendary capital of King Solomon. British archaeologist David Randall MacIver arrived to try to discover who built Great Zimbabwe in 1905. He found his work cut out for him, literally. Treasure hunters had mixed up layers of soil and discarded pottery and other archaeological clues while removing millions of ounces of gold. Randall MacEva studied the walls of the central complex, known as the Great Enclosure. Blocks of granite had been skillfully, skillfully put together without mortar, a building material that holds bricks or stones together. Randall MacEva dated the structure to the Middle Ages but he saw that the curving walls and rounded steps were completely different from Middle Eastern buildings of that time, which were usually square or rectangular. African in every detail, he became convinced that Africans had built these structures. His team sank a trench inside the great enclosure and dug up items similar to those still used by the local Shona people. Randall MacGyver also found the remains of mud houses, which he said were African in every detail. Another British archaeologist, Gutu Tutkaton Domson, came to study the origins of the site in 1929. After careful excavation of more areas, she confirmed Randall MacGyver's findings. She found that the short walls within the great enclosure had once linked hunts where people lived. Huts. She dug up pottery and soapstone dishes that were African in both style and mat- material. She also found metal objects. Bronze and iron spearheads, iron holes and nails, copper axes, and tools used for working metals, including gold. The central complex at Great Zimbabwe, known as the Great Enclosure, 
built at the rate of Great Zimbabwe's power in the 14th century. It is the largest single ancient structure south of the Sahara. Why build a wall? People build walls for various reasons. To protect against enemies, to mark boundaries, or to keep people in or out. In any case, building a large wall requires many workers and good organization. The walls at Great Zimbabwe are an impressive building achievement. Archaeologists have studied them closely for clues about their purpose. They note that the walls were not designed to support roofs. But it is also clear that the openings in the walls would not have provided effective defense against invaders, even though the hilltop location of the earliest walls gave a clear view of potential attackers. So what purpose did the walls serve? They may have been built to show the rulers wealth and power, or to protect their privacy, or people may have prayed there or visited priests. Some areas may have been used for ceremonies to celebrate young people becoming adults. Evidence for this theory comes from the fact that after the site was abandoned in the 15th century, local people saw it as a sacred place. But the precise purpose of the stone enclosures remains a mystery for now. The double chevron pattern on the outer wall of the great enclosure is typical of the area. Great Zimbabwe's hill complex overlooks the valley complex and the great enclosure. It contains the earliest stone ruins, some of which date back to the 13th century. Cattle Central Katon Domson's careful study of the layers of remains that had piled up at the site formed a picture of life at Great Zimbabwe over a period of about 1,500 years. Finds at the lowest levels showed that the site was settled by farmers and herders around 8300. They may have moved to the Poitou from nearby lowlands to escape the test test file flies. These flies can carry a disease that kills both domestic animals and people. The plateau had poor soil for farming, but it did have grass for livestock and stone for building. Great Zimbabwe, the name given to the whole site, covers almost 1,800 acres, 730 ha. Its early inhabitants built round huts from Daga, a mixture of mud, cow, dung, and gravel. Tests showed that the first stone walls were built in the 13th century on the hill. The ruins in the valley are more recent. Archaeologists think the settlement expanded to house a growing population. The city may have held 18,000 people at, at its peak in the late 13s when the walls of the Great Enclosure were built. By that time, the city had become wealthy, but that posed a question for experts. The poor soil could not support large crops, and the people would have had to buy much of their food from miles away which would have been expensive. In the 1960s and 1970s, digging turned up 140,000 pieces of animal bone that might explain great Zimbabwe's wealth, cattle. The grasslands of the plateau were a good place to rear cattle, which could be traded as well as eaten. Pots of beads. Other finds revealed another source of growing wealth. One collection of objects found at Great Zimbabwe included coral, brass wire, bronze bells, and copper finger rings. 
as well as 13th century ceramics from China and Persia and glassware from Southwest Asia. Such a wide range of finds showed that from the 12th to 15th centuries, Great Zimbabwe was part of a trading network that linked the interior with ports on the east coast. In exchange for gold and ivory from Central Africa, merchants on the coast traded beads, glassware, clove, and other goods. One container found at Great Zimbabwe in 1941 held 30,000 glass beads. Gold was also mined in the region beginning in the 13th century. Other Zimbabwe's Great Zimbabwe is not the only structure of its kind. Many stone ruins are scattered across the region. Some are older and others are more recent. But the massive size of Great Zimbabwe suggests that it was an economic and political center. Excavations at other stone-walled settlements have revealed a more complete picture of Great Zimbabwe. Gold items found at the sites offered a glimpse of the treasure that looters must have taken from Great Zimbabwe. Imported goods found at the sites showed that they were also part of an extensive trade network. They revealed rich royal burials too. No similar burials have been found at Great Zimbabwe. Many questions remain. Who built Great Zimbabwe? And why did they abandon it? Scholars still wonder about the meaning of the chevron patterns on the walls and of the mysterious half-bird, half-human figures found among the ruins. Someday archaeology may reveal the answers. One of several mysterious half-bird, half-human figures found among the ruins at Great Zimbabwe. A point of pride for the people. Great Zimbabwe is a point of pride for the peoples of the region. Before 1980, Zimbabwe was under British rule. It was called Rhodesia. In 1980, it became an independent nation. The people voted to change the name to their country to Zimbabwe. This may be the only time people have named their country for an archaeological site. This solid cone-shaped tower is a striking feature of the Great Enclosure. Its purpose is unknown, but it may have been meant to represent a grain bin.